So thanks very much for uh, coming to our presentation. I'm starting off. So um, to begin, Pearson and King's College London in the UK entered into partnership seven years ago to take the university's world-leading education online. And so Hugh and I are here today to talk to you about two of the programs that we have in our online portfolio. So an international affairs master's degree and a global security master's degree. Um, and so Hugh is, he works for King's College London, so he's going to talk about the academic content and delivery um, and the outcomes of the course. And I'm going to start us off by talking about the partnership itself very briefly, uh, the market and the audiences that we have on these degrees. Um, and so, without further ado then, um, so we've been quite busy over the past seven years. So we started out in 2016 with two master's degrees and today we have 12 across a range of different subject areas. So we've got two law degrees, two psychology degrees, a public health degree, an arts and humanities degree. Um, and uh, the way that it works is that Pearson looks after, it, it delivers research services to find commercially viable postgraduate programs to launch to a global audience, uh, marketing and recruitment services to find students for those programs, and then student support services as well to retain them all the way from initial enrollment to graduation. And King's College London takes care of all of the academic side of things. So uh, the delivery of the programs, the teaching, the course development and design, uh, assessment, um, awarding of the degrees, every, everything to do with that, essentially. So over the past seven years, we've enrolled over 7,000 students, and we've been scaling over time because it was two programs in the first year, four programs in the second year, and so on and so, so forth. So we have more exponential growth planned for future years. 65% uh, of our students are uh, based internationally, uh, so uh, in over 153 countries across the globe. Uh, the, the minimum completion time of our degrees is two years. They're all delivered part-time to fit around full-time employment outcomes and full-time family commitments. But on average, our students are taking about two years and four months because some of them, a lot of them, are taking breaks to accommodate those um, you know, peaks in career uh, workload and things like that. Um, and we start to get graduations through as well, which is really exciting. Um, we'll expect to see more and more in the years to come. So that's the partnership in brief. And in case you're not as familiar with King's College London, um, it's ranked 35th in the world according to QS World Rankings. It's a very old university, very prestigious university. You might know it for other reasons as well. So uh, DNA was discovered in a basement at King's. Virginia Woolf went to the Arts and Humanities School. Um, I see some nods, oh, <laughs> there's some, uh, it's resonating there. Um, and the School of Security Studies, which delivers these two programs, two of the graduates from the degrees there are actually acting as advisors to President Biden at the moment. So um, there's a lot of global awareness of the institution, uh, which makes it very attractive to audiences who are finally able to access degrees from their own countries as opposed to having to come to London on campus. Uh, and if uh, I'm just going to talk about structure, uh, Hugh's going to tell you the exciting stuff about all the content, but um, these two degrees that we offer, we're enrolling about 350 to 400 students a year on them. What I would say though is that Global Security just launched in January, so that, that student number is actually predominantly on international affairs. And I don't think we've found the ceiling yet on how many students uh, we will enroll, uh, because we've only had two intakes now on the global security course. So I think we should expect that number to rise, but it's very much in demand as a degree program. And I think we talk a lot about stackable credentials at events like these. What we've done with these two master's degrees is actually break them up so that you can enter onto the full length master's, or you can also take a third of it as a postgraduate certificate, or two thirds of it as a postgraduate diploma. And the benefit there, of course, is that it's lower cost, less of a time commitment, and also it kind of speaks to people wanting to take um, just some of the modules to tailor to their career outcomes. Um, and so the program is modular in nature. I think the other thing to mention is that it takes 12 modules to complete the full-length master's degree, 
but actually students have a choice of 29 modules uh, on the International Affairs course and 19 on Global Security. So they're really able to kind of select modules that tailor to the outcomes they want to achieve at the end of the degree program, which is another reason I think why it's so attractive to students. Uh, so our students are enrolled in over 80 countries around the world. I've listed out the, the top five markets that they're coming from. Uh, but I think the point that I wanted to make is that, so the, the price point of our full-length master's degree is £17,000, which may seem cheap to a US audience, but it's actually not cheap on a global level. So if you look at the populations that are coming to our programs, we're still predominantly recruiting from high-income regions around the world with that price point. And so I think as we look to expand to new markets, we're going to have to think about regional pricing policies because uh, we can generate an awful lot of leads in uh, India, for instance, but we can't convert them on the price point that we're offering for these two programs. I think that's a, a key thing to mention as well about the students that are coming. Uh, and so these are part-time degrees that are very uh, kind of focused on career outcomes. Um, and our students tend to be older than uh, the ones that come to on-campus traditionally. So the average age is 37. As, a, as I said, they have full-time careers and families to contend with. And so I thought it would be interesting to take a look at some of those careers that people are employed in when they actually come onto the course. So 72% um, of our students are employed while taking their degrees, 60% of them full-time. Uh, and they're uh, in a range of different careers. Uh, these are some examples, and they're really, really interesting. So these are job titles of people who are actually on the course. So we've got like Air Force pilots, naval officers, we have a uh, close protection officer to the prime minister, FBI agents, terrorism officers, uh, diplomats, ambassadors. Um, and so these individuals are looking to apply the learning from the course to their existing careers, or for a promotion uh, from, you know, to a different level on those tracks. Um, and then there are also people who are looking to potentially make a switch to careers or um, are in allied areas. So we do see people who are journalists or reporters on these programs who take the learning and can apply it to what they're doing. Uh, but we also have people um, kind of in that last category who are looking at these qualifications to change tracks or even just for personal interest as well because these are really, really interesting courses. Um, very, very topical, as you'll see in a moment. And then my final introductory slide to the programs is kind of this split between where people are employed. So in a range of international governments, so these represent um, areas in the world where we have military personnel or people working in international governments. And then on the other side, you have the, the kinds of world leading organizations that um, students are enrolling from. And it's worth saying that um, there is, uh, to an extent, a bit of a sponsorship element as well. So Pepsi looks like an odd one on there, but actually their global security team in the Middle East uh, was sponsored by Pepsi to come onto the program just on the postgraduate certificate level um, in order to kind of take the learning and apply it to the, the work they're doing around the world. So that was a really, really quick whistle stop tour, and I'm going to hand over to you next. Thank you, Claire. Um, so, as Claire mentioned, we've got two programs running um, uh, alongside each other International Affairs, which was started in 2018, and Global Security, which started earlier this year. Uh, International Affairs is a generalist degree, it covers a range of subjects um, and uh, looks at uh, security, strategy and history as part of its core skill areas. Uh, by contrast, Global Security focuses principally on the security element, as the title would suggest, which means it's more about theory, about international relations and so forth. Um, the, the reason being that when we were uh, looking at the, uh, the market for international affairs, there was, there was a sizable chunk of people who were converting because they wanted something a bit, a bit more theoretical focused. So we decided to try and uh, develop that with, with global security. It is possible for students on both programs to take a selection of modules from the other program as well. 
Um, there are specialist pathways within, within international affairs, which allows students to focus in on areas such as intelligence, uh, cyber security, and strategy. But there's only one pathway of global, on, on global security. A key dimension to the whole but of both programs is its research dimension. It runs throughout the entire program. Research is a key, key aspect of any degree at King's and the delivery of skills related to research expertise is one of the, sort of, you know, the core principles of, of a master's program. So both have a, a strong research dimension which culminates in the submission of a 10,000 word uh, uh, original piece of, piece of research. Uh, the reasons behind delivering the, uh, 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 these programs. Uh, the department I work for is the Defence Studies Department. It's part of an uh, academic unit at the Joint Services Command and Staff College. Our, our principal area of, uh, of expertise has been, until we launched international affairs, delivering education to the uh, military personnel. Uh, it's the sort of equivalent of the war colleges and the, uh, of the academies in this country. We already have one now. Um, so, uh, over the course of 20 years since the department was created, we developed world-leading expertise in areas such as international relations, strategic studies and military history. It's worth pointing out that those three subject areas don't ordinarily exist together within one department. They tend to be in a, a, across at least two faculties. Um, so we are quite an unusual department in that we bring together the, that range of uh, expertise and that is why we thought that launching this as an online programme, bringing that world-leading research expertise to, to a global audience would be successful and uh, so it proved. Uh, we have expertise within cyber security and uh, intelligence, so we launched with those two pathways to begin with and then we added strategic studies later on. As I mentioned, research is a key aspect of the program, and so too critical, uh, critical analysis development. So the assessments and curricula are all focused on developing those key skills and framing them in a way in which employers will understand the key aspects of those. Um, so it, we're, we're all about looking at employability and transferable skills. We also support entrants from non-traditional backgrounds. That is to say, we take on students who don't have first degrees well, some don't have first degrees and some don't have first degrees in relevant subjects. The reason being that uh, at, at our, our military uh, students, some of those don't have first degrees, uh, they have significant professional experience, so we decided to try and capitalise on that. So if you've got 10, 20 years of professional experience with a small assessment before entrance to the programme, uh, you can get on. And a number of those students have really succeeded in the programme and we'll hear from a couple of those a bit later. So we wanted to really transform the learning experience um, for uh, strategic studies, uh, international relations and conflict history on, in the online space, taking a really innovative approach to, to learning. Uh, we wanted to transfer, transform the passive uh, learning experience into one that was more active. So our uh, 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 courses are all designed around uh, activity-based uh, sessions and decision ports and games and so, uh, and so forth. Um, it's a mixture of asynchronous and synchronous activity. Uh, asynchronous is like to prepare the students for the uh, synchronous, the live webinars that take place throughout each module. And the, the whole approach is to try and challenge existing perceptions. We want to bring in a wealth of different ideas and different approaches and expose students to those and expose students to each other's different perspectives as well. So that's really at the core of the, of the program. Um, and this uh, is one of our students who recently graduated. Um, and she had quite a, quite a story to tell, as it turned out. We didn't realize this when we were teaching her, so it was quite, it was quite um, uh, moving to actually hear from her about this. Um, she said, that I applied for the program in secret because I knew that otherwise the effort would be dismissed or even not permitted. There is an erroneous concept that women only face limiting cultural expectations in far-flung places that have not evolved to experience, uh, to appreciate equality for women. The reality is that women all over the world, including the UK, who find themselves in situations where their agency has been greatly diminished because of the expectation, the expectations that they will be carers for the elderly, for the home, or for the children, uh, notions of career growth can be quickly quashed if the desire to pursue these goals 
are seen to disturb the status quo. I didn't know this aspect of her, uh, of her, of her life when we were teaching her. She's a, she's a brilliant student, um, and uh, and she did really, really well, as we'll hear in a second. But one of the key aspects to the program <coughs> is using um, uh, these different contending perspectives to try and illuminate different ways of viewing the world. So one of the modules that we've designed is uh, with, uh, a module called Women, Peace and Security. And this is designed to expose, uh, all of our modules are based on world-class uh, research by the people who wrote. Um, so the knowledge creators are also the ones that are writing, uh, writing the, pro, uh, the, the modules, as I said, they're cross-disciplinary. But modules like this are also path-breaking. They're designed to try and get students to think about uh, the world in different ways. And the Women, Peace and Security agenda that came through in the, in the 1990s is a really good way of exposing different uh, ways of thinking about why conflict and security issues happen. And as a result, they're very innovative, and this creates a real dynamic, which Mary uh, really succeeded under. And this is what she said. Um, it cannot be overstated the importance that online education plays in lifting up women and providing a chance to break out of limiting cultural norms and expectations, which often place their personal and professional career growth behind the demands that come from also being primary carers. Um, so she graduated um, with merit uh, a couple of months ago, uh, 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 very successfully, and she now has changed careers and works for the Red Cross. Uh, so I just want to give a sort of overview of the sort of way in which the program uh, flows. So we think about, we want to get the students to think about what the international order looks like, so we frame that from the outset. Uh, and then use that framing to expose what the causes of insecurity are. And we're not just talking about the causes of state insecurity, we're talking about the causes of individual insecurity, uh, institutional insecurity, regional insecurity, as well as global insecurity. So we look at it across a range of, 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 of different dimensions. We then take that learning and try and expose why those security issues may result in the outbreak of conflict, not just conventional conflict, uh, uh, state on state, but, but interstate conflict, civil wars, insurgency, terrorism, and so forth. We try and ex expose the issues behind uh, uh, those outbreaks. We then use uh, military history to examine why wars develop the way they do, why states use force in the way that they do, and why uh, what influences decisions in, in war. Uh, and then we also look at how those wars come to a conclusion, what defines victory, what defines defeat, or more commonly, stalemate and exhaustion. So the answers to all of these questions are interlinked. They, they create a, a really uh, natural flow to the program, but the skills and knowledge needed are, are very different. They come from dis different disciplines, which is why we've brought together these, these three areas. Um, and this was really exposed to us by uh, Jeff Pierce, who uh, graduated again uh, a few months ago, having completed a dissertation which took him to uh, Somalia. Uh, to conduct the research. And he said, naturally I feel a certain amount of personal validation. People could always look to my work, but now they know that I have put in the time to study and analyze certain subjects overseen by some of the most respected international affairs experts. I'll turn 60 next year. This be, has been an intensely personal achievement because I finally made it to university. I got to earn my degree from one of the highest ranked institutions in the world. So Jeff, uh, entered our program again, non-standard route, didn't have a degree, and now has a master's. Uh, looking in a bit more detail at the content itself, so we try to expose students to, to uh, through uh, the use of cutting edge case studies. Uh, one that, that um, uh, has part, been part of the program at the beginning is used to looking at uh, global pandemics as a way of exposing uh, uh, the, the development of insecurity and security problems. Uh, the uh, specific case study that we use is the uh, long and short term issues related to the H HIV and AIDS pandemic. We also looked at Ebola and now we will be looking at COVID. Um, and I think we now all, we all have a real appreciation of how impactful that could be, which previously I think wasn't necessarily obvious on a global scale. We also use uh, decision forcing games so we use uh, real-life case studies 
um, specifically the uh, decision not to attack Syria in 2013 when the use of chemical weapons occurred, failure of deterrence and the implications that's ha that that has. We take students through a series of staged um, uh, decision forcing exercises to work out why the decisions that were taken then had such ramifications. And that all then links to innovative assessments. We don't just use essays, we use a range of different assessments, policy paper writing, presentations, uh, group presentations, and uh, uh, as well as the tradition, uh, traditional essay. There's always the place for essay writing. Um, I'm an 18th century historian, so I'm not going to change that. <laughs> um, Links to that, of course, uh, is the use of historical case studies. So this is one of the decision forcing games. Uh, we also use the Cuban Missile Crisis as an example. Um, we get the students to think about it in, in innovative and different ways. Um, so uh, to, to summarize then, we, we use international relations, uh, the theories behind that, realism and liberalism, which uh, uh, some of our students, I think, have thought are particularly relevant to the modern world. We'll come to that in a second. To explain why wars break out. We use strategic studies to, expl uh, to explain how wars develop in the way they do, and military history to uh, provide important context. This, I think, is illustrated by recent events. Um, I'll come, uh, uh, the, the quote at the top there, the end of the end of history. Again, it's a bit of a reference to Francis Fukuyama, uh, but one of our students actually gave that to us, and we're in the process of changing all of our uh, uh, taglines to reflect it, because I think it's just perfect. But history has been used, uh, uh, in, in, in a bad way and in a good way by the protagonists in the, in, in, in the latest conflict. Uh, Putin has been using history to try and undermine Ukraine's uh, position, uh, under, undermine Ukraine's sovereignty, and President Zelensky has been using history to try and generate support on an international scale. So when he addressed the British House of Commons uh, a few weeks ago, uh, he deliberately made reference to the Blitz, to fighting at churches, fighting on the beaches, speech when he addressed Congress, he referenced Pearl Harbor and 9-11. So he's very good at, at, at using history to make those points. And uh, this is the student who... Uh, Let me give you some of my thoughts on what I consider to be the real world professional applicability of the International Affairs course of King's. In the whole degree program, I relish the fact that it spanned vast swathes of the academic world. The curriculum covered off on all of the great debates within the broad realm of international affairs. Some of these debates I was sort of engaged with more naturally than others. At the time, some seemed the stuff of outdated academic theorizing for its own sake, with no real world relevance. For example, listening to John Mearsheim rant about offensive realism or digging into the intricate complexities of nuclear deterrence theory all seemed the stuff of a bygone era. It seemed too abstract. Russia's invasion of Ukraine obviously changes all that. There's now the active threat of chemical and nuclear war in Europe. And this brings home just how relevant these theories are today as they always have been. The course directly helped me to understand this current crisis and a range of other ones um, that are directly supportive of my day job armed with a much broader array of perspectives from this course, I find it much easier to start unraveling the current conflict and using this insight to inform my company about, broadly, the management. Of stuff. Big cut off there. Um, but, I mean, you get, you get the point. He, I mean, he really uh, demonstrates, I mean, uh, we, I think we should just use that in all our advertising because that really encapsulates precisely what we were trying to do with the, with, uh, with the program. Um, so uh, yeah, that, that's that's it. I'll be very glad to take uh, take any questions you might have. Late on the Tuesday afternoon. <laughs> Curious, you said something about synchronous and then um, asynchronous. Could you just explain that, how you integrate both a little bit more? Uh, so, uh, I'll use an example of the module I wrote, um, uh, which is looking at intelligence. So, we, 
uh, divide the module into three, into three units, looking at understanding how intelligence works, the organization of intelligence gathering, and then the impact of intelligence on the international system. So it's a sort of broad overview of, of, of the use of intelligence. And then the way in which we get the students to engage with it is to expose them through case studies. So we divide students into five groups, each with a different case study that they then will use to uh, uh, write throughout the, the, uh, the module. So there's one of the Suez crisis, Cuban Missile crisis, um, the road to war in Iraq, um, the end of Cold War, those, those sorts of things. Um, ones where they've got, um, um, you know, we can use the de de declassified intelligence sources to, to you know, get them to see about this in the way that intelligence officers might be. Um, so in the first unit, they have to do a sort of a, a source analysis of the, of the intelligence source that we've given them. And they will engage with each other on the discussion forums uh, in their groups to dissect that source. That then sets them up for the uh, live webinar uh, at the end of the unit where they will come together and present their findings to me or whoever the, or whoever the tutor is. Um, and then in the second unit, they look at how intelligence is organized in each, in each case study. And then the third uh, unit, they look at the wider implications of the intelligence issue on international security. So some have relatively limited impacts, and there's reasons for that. Others have absolutely colossal impacts, i.e. the road to war in Iraq. Uh, so it, uh, uh, throughout that, they're, they're, they're working on their uh, 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 on the different questions in the in the uh, discussion forums, uh, which are moderated by the tutors, and then also presenting that in the live webinars um, in order to get live feedback from both me and from each other. Actually, actually, it's much better feedback from each other. <laughs> you know. Thank you. Um, I imagine since you are such an international crowd that the discussions between students, since they have quite different perspectives, I mean their background is quite different, leads to some lively discussions. Do, is that true and does that add to the program or is it a distraction? Oh, it's definitely not a distraction. Um, I, so sometimes it means that the, the webinar goes on, you know, it's uh, uh, we, we we're supposed to be talking for an hour and a half and, and, and we, we end up talking for for two, uh, two or two and a half hours, because, uh, and that's because of the range of uh, views. I mean, quite often we get intelligence personnel in the, on the course, at least every module, every time I've taught that module, there has been at least one intelligence professional in the, in the group. So they bring a dramatically different interpretation of what's, of what's going on, and also uh, quite a, a varied, uh, 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 for, for them, I think they are, um, Shocked by some of the intelligence, the, the analytical issues that have occurred in, 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 the, in the case study, and they're learning a lot from it. They also help to teach the other students about some intelligence practices, which is which is really valuable. Elsewhere, you get completely different perspectives coming in. So we've got uh, uh, lawyers who provide a real uh, ethical viewpoint on the subject, um, and then we'll have uh, 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 military personnel. About how the uh, about how the intelligence can be can be utilised. So it really brings quite a, uh, a diversity of of opinion and and experience into the into the discussion. So never a distraction. Well, that sounded <laughs> really quite serious. <laughs> I think we've been upstaged. <laughs> Well, we won't keep you here uh, in, in, in silence. So thank you very much for, for uh, attending. And um, if you have any questions, then, uh, then please do drop us a line. Thank you.